Morning. Great that all of you made it out of your bed after the nice uh, party last evening. Seems like some of some other people didn't do that. <laughs> um, so today we're going to learn about how to make search work, and in, in particular how to find out if your search box doesn't work. How can I tell you something about that? Um, I happen to be working for Elasticsearch. Apart from that, I'm a member of the Apache Software Foundation, co-founder of Apache Mahout, which does machine learning, and co-founder of Berlin Buzzwords, a conference on search scale and store in Berlin. But apart from that, I've spent the past couple of years in companies that do search. First four years in a consultancy doing uh, search applications for German publishers, and then two years at Nokia Maps, and now, of course, with Elasticsearch. And one repeating question always was how to find out whether the search box is actually working, and how to convince uh, both customers and your manager what the real problems are, as opposed to what they think the problem is. Okay. So this is usually when I go around, take my microphone and ask people who they are and ask them to give a brief introduction because I have a background in doing meetups. I won't do that to a tired crowd this morning, but I still want to have a quick short uh, show hands. How many of you have ever cursed a search engine that they've used because it just didn't work out? Just was sucked. Good. Um, how many of you have integrated search into some website? Be it Google Search? Okay, pretty much everyone. How many of you have built your own search application, have integrated Lucene, Elasticsearch, whatever? Well, yeah. How many of you know about Apache Lucene? Good, very good, so I don't need to. Uh, anyone who knows Oracle Endica? Just one of you? Okay. What about Apache Solar? Yeah, nearly everyone, Elasticsearch. Yay! <laughs> um, so I first briefly want to show you that search isn't just about searching web pages. It isn't just about searching text. It can be quite a bit more diverse. Uh, quickly skim over the use cases because many of you were familiar with building search applications and what that involves. So the first non-text application that comes to my mind is, uh, of course, a mapping search, a POI search. The use case here is that given you have a user who has a mobile device, that user sends you latitude and longitude, and maybe a category, say the user is searching for a restaurant, or sending you the name of that restaurant, and you want to return that particular um, POI that's interesting to the user. Or they are just sending you some complete address, including street name, city name, and house number, or it's just a fraction of that address, and you then have to return the correct location on the map. So this is something that can easily be implemented with a search engine. In Nokia's case, it's mostly been implemented with a combination of Lucene, Solar, so typical, um, typical use case. Another not quite so obvious use case is you want to do market research. So you've got some brand names that you want to monitor. Um, you take all the mentions of that brand name in social networks, be it Twitter or Facebook or what have you, put it in your search engine and then do trend analytics on it. Um, in this case, I happen to have a baby and I happen to have a Twitter account, so I got some of these temper snappies. Um, another use case, which is not quite so obvious, but what, which is particularly popular with Elasticsearch is you have log files, say standard web, web server log files or standard application log files, and you feed them into your search application, and again, to trend analysis on that. Elasticsearch comes with Logstash to put these log files into the search engine, and with Kibana for real, visual, visualization on top, so you can easily monitor your applications with that and can easily scale out. Another slightly more typical use case, you've got a product database. In this case, it's a database of apartments. And you want to filter them not only by location and distance, but you may also want to enter some kind of freeform searches. You may want to filter down um, using particular attributes that you may not be aware of once you create the database. 
So usually these searches tend to be powered by um, usual search engines like we've seen as well. So my focus today will be the end user facing search application. So not so much the uh, logging use case, but more the product database, mapping search, or typical usual text search. Now the three dimensions that make up search engine quality tend to be uh, user interface, because if the user interface sucks and you don't find the search box, that doesn't help you anything. Also, if the query language isn't what your user expects it to be, it doesn't help you as well. <coughs> the second dimension tends to be responsiveness of the search. It's usually that if a user enters a search term and you get your response in way more than 100 milliseconds, that web page is uh, perceived to be um, very slow. So it's like a, a lag that can be noticed by the user, and with, that's something that people turns away. That he turns people away. Third dimension is search result quality. What I mean with that is, is the search results that the user is searching for actually in my index? Is the document that the user is looking for in that index? So it's particular important important for the mapping use case. If the restaurant that the user is searching for is not in the index, you can't do anything with ranking. You just can't return it. Second one is if the query terms that the user is using in order to find the document are actually associated with the document. Think of synonyms, for example. Some person may search for, I don't know, computer, but it may really mean um, Apple MacBook or the other way around. And the third one, which usually comes to mind, is um, ranking quality. Like, is the document that the user is looking for actually ranked on top, or is it somewhere at the lower end of the ranking? Our presentation will focus only on the ranking quality and how to find out whether all documents actually are in the index. We won't focus on, uh, use, uh, on speed or on UI. If we think about how to um, determine whether such ranking quality is correct. We first have to remind ourselves how search and search engines are typically integrated and what typical search problems are. Let's think of a mapping application and let's think our users searching for Toronto. Now, the, the obvious answer for that query clearly is the city in Canada. That should be first result, right? Now, however, what if this particular user is somewhere in the middle of Berlin, has zoomed his viewport down to this particular area? If you're very familiar with Berlin, and in particular with that area, you know that there's a tasty German restaurant called Toronto. So our search may actually not mean the city of Toronto in Canada, but may mean this um, tasty little restaurant. So result ranking quality isn't actually that obvious and is not as objective as it may seem. So a lot of our ranking depends on user context. Where, where am I? What am I really looking for? Something else that's in, uh, influencing my, my perceived quality is um, spell checking. Think of typical spelling errors that if you just uh, use predefined queries that you think of when doing your unit tests, you may not think of all the ways that uh, people misspell search terms, but you do see it in your logs. Another thing is um, personal preference versus um, global popularity or versus general popularity. Just because your manager's favorite children's book is on top in your book search doesn't mean that this children's book is actually the one that everyone is looking for. So you may want to, again, have a look at what users really are looking for. Another aspect that you can think of seasonality, just because your search works in summer doesn't mean that it's great in winter. So there may be destinations that are uh, depending on the season. Um, there's also a great difference when checking if your search works if you know, know how the system works as opposed to being a newbie user. Your, your typical user doesn't know how, you, how even an index works. For them, it's just magic. They throw you some query terms and you, they get back relevant documents, or that's what they expect. They don't know how that index is built. 
So if you craft your test queries yourself, you always know how the system works and you know how to craft your test queries. We had the problem of subjectivity. Another example for that would be take a random set of Berlin people from different areas and ask them for the best ice cream in town. You don't want to know how many different answers you get. Another place, there's, a different, there's different meanings for the same term in different countries. Restaurant in Germany typically means a nice place where you go to have dinner with your girlfriend. In the US, it may be a place where you go to get food and where you can sit down. So there once was its advertisement in Germany from McDonald's, like see different restaurant. Um, Americans do expect you to return McDonald's if you search for restaurant. In Germany, it depends on who you ask, whether that's embarrassing or not. Also, there may be users who are including additional information in order to find their result, which you don't have in the index. Think of a music search engine where you don't put the published date uh, into the index. If the published date is part of the search query, then you can't use this information, of course. Now, the first step towards a better search engine are metrics that I typically call finding the elephant in the room. That's stuff that, that is very outstanding, very obvious once you take a closer look. What do I mean with that? You go to your log files where you, should, where you log your searches and you search for zero response queries. So either on each search you note down how many res uh, responses you get, or if you didn't do that at, your, at implementation time, you at least take these queries, re rerun them on your system, say on a test instance that has all the data, and look for queries that return no results. What you find out with that is stuff like spelling mistakes. And you should in particular be looking for common spelling mistakes and include these different terms, say, as synonyms. You find searches for non-indexed information. And again, you should be looking for um, repeated occurrences of this. So if it's something that's very often, that should point you towards a feature you should be implemented in, you should implement in your next sprint. Also, it could point you towards information that's lost in pre-processing. There's a popular movie in uh, Germany, which is called uh, 23, 23 nicht ist wie es scheint. If people just search for 23 and you normalize all numbers to a specific term number but don't keep the actual number, you won't be able to return the movie for that particular search. So again, if you look for zero response queries, that already points you towards problems in your implementation. Next step would be you do not only log the query plus the response, you also log which results a user clicked on. What you get for that is that you can, at a very first step, search for searches where you don't have any interaction. So you are explicitly looking for queries where you did get results, but no one ever clicked on them. So obviously these results are crap. And again, you can look for common query, re query reformulations. That is, you take your query, you group these queries into sessions, say, given it a certain time frame, plus a, a returning user is one query session, and then you look for common reformulations. Again, this may point you towards synonyms that you've forgotten. All of these approaches are great for finding bugs in your ranking. They are great for finding bugs in your current implementation, and they are great for prioritizing features, because it doesn't pay very well if you just pick a random, I want to add new synonyms to this, such and such a term if that's not targeted to, towards your users. However, it's still a very coarse assessment. So if you want to go a little bit deeper and more fine-grained, we will first take a look at search in a nutshell. That is how Lucene and Elasticsearch are typically integrated. Again, we have our search. So what you this is what you type. You type Toronto. Of course, if you um, look at the search applications, that's not all you get. You get a little bit more information. You may get the user's location, because that's maybe what the uh, browser sends through a location API. It could also be simply the IP that you use. 
Um, so the search application knows approximately where you are. Also, typically, your browser will send a preferred user language. Typically, if, say, you have a mapping, mapping application, you will send some kind of viewport. You may have the default one, but you may also have zoomed down to your interest in, interesting area already. You will send information about your operating system. So if you have Linux and you send the query Apple to a text search engine, that may mean something totally different than if you do have an Apple MacBook and you're searching for Apple. The search may have information on previous searches if you're a returning user and may target it that way. Also, something very obvious that you do not need to send us time of day, day of week. Searches that are interesting on Monday to Friday may not be the same as uh, searches done on Saturday and Sunday, same for working hours as opposed to free time. On the other hand, um, for each result, there's also attached some in additional information. There's not only just the name Toronto attached to the city of Toronto, there's also something like city size. So if you have to decide whether to return the restaurant or the city, it may be interesting to know if that city is particularly large, if it's far away from the user, or if that is a popular um, vacation destination. You, do have in, you may have rating information on the restaurant. If it's a very popular restaurant, it may, may be a good idea to return that restaurant as opposed to the city. You probably have information if you do um, this kind of tracking on how often people click on a certain result. So in addition to just the query string, you do have lots of additional information. You have your query that's being sent through the browser. The browser adds metadata. That metadata plus the query arrives at your search application. And now something interesting happens because this search application has to formulate, say in our case, an elastic search query. So usually this query encodes information that's sent through the browser, that's run, sent through some kind of um, mobile device, if that's a mobile application, plus the user query, plus maybe time, time, on, time and date. Um, this query, of course, goes to your search backend and you get your documents back. The interesting part happens there because this is where you decide how to weight all the different ranking signals and how to combine them. So this is where you decide how to take these different boxes and probably many, many more of these and how to combine them in a query that works. Um, questions that you may want to answer is, I found a query that works or I found a query transformation that works, but here I've got a different query transformation that's much, much faster on my backend. Do they still give the same results? Another question that's obvious is how should each of these signals be weighted? Is it more important that my city is large, or is it more important that my restaurant has a lot of positive ratings? And of course, which function should I use in order to combine them? Which signals um, should emphasize the importance of a POI or of a search result, which signals should decrease, decrease that importance. So the obvious solution, take a few queries, take a several test configurations that looked like they could make sense, and test them. Typical solution for that that I often see in practice is you have your developer. Developer decides, um, I'm going to test these five configurations I'm going to fire a handful of queries and I'll see if it works. <coughs> awesome idea, except that the developer clearly knows how the system works, so they know which queries work perfectly well and which queries definitely do not work. So your resulting ranking function is targeted towards working for your developers. Maybe not so good. Another typical solution? You've got management making the decisions. You've got a product owner, you've got a uh, customer, they sit next to the developer and say, look at the ranking function. Again, they choose uh, a set of usually a handful of queries, maybe 10, maybe 20, but as management doesn't have a lot of time, it's definitely not 100 queries. They run these queries, they're usually targeted towards their interests. Um, typically, it doesn't work as well. So. Selecting just a handful of queries and firing these manually 
usually not a good idea. A better solution or a great solution actually would be sitting next to a user, looking over their shoulder and using real queries. Now you can't go out in the wild, sit, sit in a cafe and look over the shoulder of your users. However, what you can do is if you do have decent locking, you can indir indirectly look over the shoulder of your user. You can take your query um, lock, sample uh, a decent number, say 100, and you cease in order to do e evaluation. What you get through is that. So first of all, don't take queries only from 5 a.m. in the morning on Monday morning. Take it from all over the times that you want to uh, cover. Second, don't take only five queries, but take multiple. Also, don't take queries just for a certain location, but take it all over the space where you want to have your uh, search perform very well, except when your uh, target is to improve search for, say, searches coming out of St. Augustine. So that's what I mean if, it's, if I say use a diverse enough sample, not just a small fraction, but really do a sample. Now, the solution is take a lot of queries, take a diverse enough sample. Yeah? So the question was, what was the target function when sampling? Set is something you have to define before taking the sample. If your business goal is to improve search for searches coming out of Germany, you should take queries coming out of Germany. If your goal is as a first step to improve or either to improve search for all your queries or and for all your users or if it's at least to evaluate how well your search works for all your users, then you take a sample from uh, all incoming queries. So in particular at the mapping application, it does make sense to narrow down uh, from which set of queries you take your sample. You may have the objective to improve search in a certain country. You may have the objective to improve search for a certain city. You may have the objective to improve search for a certain continent. So you always define what your target user group is that you want to improve for. Do you try to optimize for best experience or average experience or the worst experience of your users once you choose the sample set? Um, so if I, the question was whether I improve the best average or worst experience, again, that's up to you defi to define what you want to do. What you typically do is to look at the average. So you typically look at the performance of, say, 100 queries, and then you average it, and then you know how you perform. If, however, um, you say, okay, I do have, I want to see what my worst queries are, and I want to see if that's a specific type of query, and I want to improve that specific type, then you would look at the worst performing queries, of course. But the typical uh, starting point is to look at the average. And again, you could even say, okay, I do not want to sample uh, by geography, but I do want to sample for certain types of queries. Say, I only want to sample queries that have a certain device attached to it. I want to sample only queries that have something to do with eat, eating and drinking and going out. So that's, so that's again your business objective from all your queries that you have, which ones to, do you take? Which ones do you want to improve? And typically the first step is to improve the overall imp experience. And at a certain point you, rea you will realize that you can't easily improve the overall experience, but there's a few types of queries and a type, few types of users which are like low-hanging fruit in order to improve them. So you take the sample just from that, compute the um, quality there, improve it there, and then only um, do it for that. You should again rerun your experiment on the whole set to make sure that you didn't um, decrease quality for the remaining users and queries. Make sense? Okay. So 
if you think about this translation of uh, ranking signals towards a Elasticsearch query, what this really means if you run these kinds of experiments is that you define sort of like a template to translate from your um, rank, from your user supplied query data and metadata to a real Elasticsearch query. And that's where Elasticsearch actually helps you. They provide um, template queries. There so you can define, okay, I want a Elasticsearch query executed. And in these spots, I want to have uh, variables filled with the actual data. And that data will be what comes out of your log files, what's being supplied by your users. So you can easily define multiple templates, one for each um, signal configuration uh, combination that you want to test, and can then run your experiment against the index without having to rewrite any code that outputs the uh, corresponding query. Now there are three ways of evaluating how good you are. There's a manual um, labeling and tagging effort that you can do. There's one effort that kind of sort of works in an offline mode after, um, after having put your search online and having collected logs, and there's one online metric. We will first look at the manual tagging work. The goal here is to still do a manual equality evaluation, but to use real user queries and real returned results. And the goal is to decide whether those results for these queries are any good. So you take your um, query logs. If you're really good you, for each query, you've also logged which res results you've returned. If you didn't do that, remember that you can always rerun these queries against the system which was live when these queries were run. So you re reply them and you send them off to taggers. Could be uh, mechanical Turk people, could be people you hire yourself. One thing to keep in mind is that you need to train these people. So you need to tell them what kind of result you expect or what kind of result is kind of like, um, kind of an edge case. It typically involves going through a few iterations of queries that you uh, tag together with these people. Second thing this uh, entails is that typically you should have at least two to three people look at one query independently. What you get through that is that you can take a look at those queries where the opinions of people were largely different. If everyone agrees, it's very obvious. If everyone disagrees, uh, there's a high disagreement rate, and you should again take a closer look at these um, queries. Now, there's two things that you can do. The one is like the Coca-Cola Pepsi experiment. You take a side-by-side -side comparison. You don't tell them which side is which, which is new and which is old. And you tell them, tell me which one is better. From that, you can deduce which ranking function works better. It usually works for, how, for whatever ranking functions you want to evaluate. It's slightly tricky because you have to evaluate complete ranking sets. So you have to evaluate, usually you do it for the top five, top 10 results. It's typically for the first search result page because that's what people tend to look at. People don't tend not to page. What's also tricky with that is to evaluate after the fact, after you've got the result of which one is better, to say why it was why it's better, if you do not track additional information, if you do not tell your people, um, tell me why it's better, what what went what went wrong on which side. A next step could be um, tell annotators to pick for each uh, result set and tell me if which which of the results that I saw is a good one and which one is a bad one. What I get from that is for each query a set of annotations of this result is relevant, this one's not irrelevant, this one is relevant, etc. So you get multiple sets of C's. What you can do from that is compute a precision. Precision means of all the results that are returned, how many were relevant, which portion was relevant. It's great as a first overview and typically if you hear precision and you do have a background in machine learning, you may tell me that, hey, there's a second part missing and that is recall. Recall meaning of all the relevant results that I should have returned, how many did I return? If you think of web search 
um, tell me how to annotate all the internet in order to find out how many relevant results there were. So what you look at in search, especially in web search, even in, uh, in a geo search, is only precision. Because even in geo search, you can imagine that in order to find the rel all relevant uh, restaurants in Berlin, you have to be very knowledgeable about Berlin in order to give me a, some kind of recall. However, precision does have a problem here, even in the setting. And that is that the two results that's, that you see below are counted as equal. And clearly, they are not equally good, because in the, in the right-hand side, you have an irrelevant on top. In the left-hand side, you have a relevant one on top. So me personally, I would prefer the, the left-hand ranking. Also, all documents are counted as either relevant or irrelevant. There's no edge cases. There's no, if I don't have anything else, that's OK. But if I do have a lot more better results, I should better leave it out. So the first fix is to introduce relevancy grades. Something, something like, it's embarrassing to show that. It's eh, kind of OK-ish. It's pretty good. And this is essential to show. So you add, add these relevancy grades over your ranking function, and you get a better evaluation. Second fix is um, to discount the lower ranks. So in, if you have a very relevant result, but it's ranked very low, its contribution to the overall sum should be lower than if it would have been on top. So there's two ways of, to, to compute it, depending on how much discounting you want. Last but not least, you can normalize. Because imagine you have only one relevant result. You don't want to show five results just in order to um, push the number up. What you want to do is show this one result. So you can normalize by, for that query, what is the maximally achievable discount, uh, discounted cumulative gain. You compute that by simply ordering all your results by relevancy grade and computing CDG for that and do the normalization afterwards. There's still a few uh, issues that you could fix. There's things like the observations that people do not tend to look at a well, result that's just below a relevant one. There's different metrics that fix this, like ERR, for instance. I'm not going to go into details here. There's publications outside that explain it much better. Now, if you do have manual taggers, and if they go over your results anyway, there's two things that you can tell them that are cheap to accomplish, but that may help your implementation a great deal. One thing is tell them to look for embarrassing stuff. Um, giving a little bit, bit of time to look for the funny stuff here, it's OK if you look for a baseball club bat. It's OK to show a baseball ball, but the lower right results may not be what people should be shown, even if they do purchase it. Um, so this is still working in Amazon, but only in Amazon DE. Another thing that people, taggers, can look for is, given a query, could I have, could I have answered this query with a current index? Um, Tralala t happens to be a kindergarten in Berlin. It's not in the index, so it can't be returned. If your tagger sees some portion of an address or sees some, something that looks like a restaurant or that looks like a kindergarten that they know of, they can easily tell you, hey, there's something missing. And you shouldn't be just fixing these issues, but you should be looking for patterns here. So is there a certain category of POI missing? Is, in, is there an issue in a certain country? Is there an issue in a certain city? So don't fix just this one inter instance, but use it as like a, 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 a some, kind of, some kind of pointer towards a bigger problem that you should be looking for. So this kind of manual tagging is great for assessing your current ranking quality. It's great for comparing two ranking functions because you can always do the A-B testing. You can always compute the precision value for both ranking functions. Doing it for the second ranking function, if that second ranking function is slightly similar to the first one, is even uh, cheaper. 
because most likely you're not returning completely different results, so you can reuse these annotations. However, it's still expensive because it's manual work. We can fix that by going slightly more to, to a slightly more automated approach. Um, go, going for a slightly more automated approach usually means getting quite a bit more noise into your measurements as well. So these are not quite as precise as manual tagging, but a lot cheaper. What you need for it in your log files is the queries. You need the results that you return, and you need the exact results that the user clicked on. So in your search result page, you need some kind of feedback loop towards your application that tells you which link a user clicked on. It's something that's sometimes missing in applications. Okay, once I have these three, um, these three input data sets, what should I do? What should my target function look like? Should I simply try to increase engagement with search results? That's what's typically done for e-commerce websites. Um, here's a Microsoft experiment gone wrong. They had messed up the search function completely, but that resulted in a uh, increased revenue from uh, search result advertisement clicks and in an increase in search result clicks. Why was that so? Because ranking was so completely broken, people had to do a lot more clicking in order to find the relevant result. So in the short term, that means an increase in, in revenue and an increase in clicks. In the long term, however, that doesn't mean means that people stay with your search. So this is not what you want to do. There's a publication out there already for nearly 10 years now where people did an eye tracking experiment. How do people interact with search? People tend, which is obvious, to scan search results top to bottom. So that means um, I can use clicks as relevancy feedback. However, what I cannot do is to use a click on a search result as an absolute um, relevancy feedback point. What I can do, however, is to say, okay, somebody clicked on the third result, but they skipped the first and the second one. So probably the first and the second one weren't quite as interesting. So you can take it as um, re uh, relative feedback and incorporate that back into your, your, your ranking function. Something that is a little bit more noisy, but of which you also, but what you can also use in order to increase your data is to look at um, clicks being more important than whatever was clicked before. Because the reasoning behind that is probably the user came back because she wasn't, inter she wasn't happy with the first result. If you think about your search behaviors, that may be true for quite a few cases. In some cases, it may just mean, okay, I want a second opinion. I want to read more on the same topic. So that's where the noise is coming from. Another uh, thing to look at could be you clicked on something, but you didn't click what was just below that because people tend to scan what's around whatever they do click. You cannot say that what you did click is more important than what was on position 10, let alone on position 100 because you cannot um, say that the user actually saw these results, but you can be reasonably certain that they saw what was around the click position. So there's quite some noise in this data, but it should be very cheap to get. So there's a few gotchas here. There's something called presentation bias. Users tend to be very uh, trusting in your search results, so they tend to trust that the first result actually is a relevant one. Even if you turn the ranking completely around, there's still a preference for clicking on the first result. So you ha somehow have to account for that. Also, users, of course, only uh, scan a limited number of results. So what you cannot find out with that is if your ranking is completely broken for a certain use case. So if for a certain use case, your interesting stuff is on page 100, you're not going to learn it through this kind of um, metric. And again, it's only possible for live implementations. So, so this means if your ranking is completely broken and it's going to scare away your users, um, so this may not be the best, best way to find out because your users may, may have run away once you know that it's really broken. 
It's great for assessing current ranking function functionality. It's great for comparing two ranking functions. It's slightly risky if you introduce a dramatic change and you are not absolutely certain that this dramatic change leads to an improvement, or at least to comparable user experience, because it's life only. So the last approach, which is now really life only, if you are reasonably certain that your new ranking function works, but you still want to have a comparison against your live system, and you want to show that it works, it's a typical A-B testing setting. You again, for evaluation, needs the queries, results shown, clicks, and that for both ranking functions. Now you can do two setups. One setup is you take a small portion, portion of your users and show them just the new ranking function, and you take a larger portion where you are safe and show them the old ranking function. And then you just compare where do users click. Do they tend to click on the top results more or do they just randomly click or whatever? Another um, approach that tends, to be, uh, that tends to work very well is to take for a subset of your users a kind of simple like approach. You take both ranking functions, the old one and the new one, and you interleave them. With that, you can say, um, did my users click more on the old results or more on the new results? In order to account for presentation bias, you switch the interleaving, once the old one and once the new one is on top. And then from that, you deduce wh uh, which one is better. It's slightly less risky because you always have the old results in between, and it's also easy to interpret because you know where results are coming from. So this is great for comparing two ranking functions. However, it's online only. So you don't want to scare away your users by putting something online which clearly messes the user experience completely up. So in a real life experience, if you want to put the puzzle together, you won't be using just one of these approaches. You will typically use um, a chain of filters in order to evaluate your ranking signals and in order to evaluate co your combinations. So you will typically, your developers and your management or whatever comes to you with a new ranking idea. I want to introduce this new signal or I want to change ranking. So they typically come with two to three queries where it really improves the experience. So you will go and first, maybe first do an A-B test that that's offline. Show your annotators both versions and tell them which, tell me which one is better. Or you will rerun it against a pre-annotated set of search results and you will want to see is my ranking still kind of okay? Is it better or is it worse given on the annotations that I already have? Maybe re-annotating whatever came up new. If your new ranking function succeeds in these um, annotations, in these annotation experiments, and it's reasonably good. Re this reasonably good, I mean, um, it does, um, it's good enough in order to uh, reason to have that ranking function put online. You will then go and potentially run either a live, live A-B test, or you will put it online and track the clicks that are being done. So you will always have this filtering chain. You will first probably do the um, pre precision computation. You will then potentially do an A-B test, um, like offline A-B tests that we had before, like the side-by-side -side comparison. And then you will potentially do an online A-B test. So you will always have a multi-step process. And what you will see is that most, many of the great ideas that people come up with aren't actually that great or are great just for a very, very small subset of queries. And then it's up to you to, to prioritize and to think whether it's worth the risk to put that online or whether to go with your current solution. Um, if you want to read further information on this topic, there's uh, lots of information online. First reference that you should look at are the publications on the right hand side. Um, first, the first one is done by guys in, at Microsoft. They've done A-B tests and they've compared 
for instance, which kind of metrics influence how your ranking function changes. Like if you use the wrong um, target function, like for instance, in improving clicks, um, user engagement with your search results, what happens? Um, the other interesting publications is the one by Joachim on the um, query chains. That's the one which tells you how to do search result interleaving, and that's the one that tells you how to interpret click data. The interesting books, there is in a free as in free in free as in free beer book called Information Retrieval that you can learn, uh, that you can read and learn lots about evaluation functions in there. They also talk about computing uh, recall for a search. This works great if you have academic um, collections, document collections like Trek, for instance. There you know which documents are in that collection and you can compute the recall. Keep in mind that in your real life experience, this may not be as easily computed, computable as you think. There's one book I in particular like, that's Search Patterns. It's not about ranking evaluation and not about ranking quality, but it talks a lot about the features that a search engine should have uh, in terms of user interface, in terms of user features that makes the experience a lot better. Like for instance, the obvious faceting stuff. And there are some web pages online. There's a talk at Berlin Buzzwords that talked about ranking quality at Yandex. And there is publications by Google which talk about how they do um, search quality, where again, it boils down to a multiple filtering, uh, multiple filtering step process, where first you go for the annotated um, document set, which you can easily use in order to compute your performance, then going for A-B, for side-by-side -side comparisons, and then going for A-B tests. And throwing out multiple filtering and signal ideas underway. So it's usually you come up with a signal, you make a change, you run it through annotators if the, to see if the change is worth anything. You re-annotate only changed results. You use multiple metrics potentially precision, pot potentially NTCG, potentially ERR, or whatever uh, corresponds to your search. Also keep in mind that precision typically is used for the top N results, and you should target the size of N to your user interface. If you are showing only five results on the first result page, it doesn't make a lot of sense to compute precision at 10. And then you only test those ranking changes on real users where you've seen before that it does make a difference and it does make a positive difference. And with that, I'm happy to take questions. And I have been given these tiny little elks to hand out to people who uh, ask me questions. Now, as I've gotten, gotten one question already, no, it's the one looking in the back. <laughs> <laughs> I got one question during the talk. <laughs> Not sorry, thank you for the question. <laughs> Any further questions? <laughs> Only one egg per person, but the question is fine. <laughs> So the, que so the question was whether Elasticsearch comes with any features that helps with quality improvement. And that's a very great question because um, that's actually on our roadmap. So I've been tasked with um, impl imp implementing support for that. So the first step will be um, supporting users with log sampling. A second step will be supporting users with doing the A-B testing stuff. And way ahead of that, if you think about it, you do have annotations, you do have logs, you do have clicks. The next logical thing is to learn your ranking function and to not manually think about which signals I want to integrate and in particular how to weight them. You could easily learn that ranking, that weighting uh, automatically. So doing this, learning to rank is like the ultimate goal. It's not like something that's going to be released next week, of course. Unless you want to supply a patch. <laughs>
<laughs> but it's, it is on the roadmap. Because so, so the reasoning behind that is that what I have seen and what many other developers have seen is developers tend to know at least some of that. But usually in their companies, they don't get the time to implement the sampling. They don't get the time to implement, say, a annotation framework. They may get time and money to pay for uh, um, mechanical Turk people, but there is still quite a lot of overhead in order to come up with a decent um, sampling approach, with a decent annotation approach, with feeding that back into your application, with running this across your current index. So there's lots of infrastructure code involved, and that's something that Elasticsearch in the future will uh, help you with. What kind of information do you have to give to the annotators for them to be able to score? Uh, uh, like, what do they do? They follow fixed rules that you set up beforehand, and it's like a closed up. So the question, the question was for your annotators: Which information do you have to give them? Um, first of all, it depends on your use case. Which information you have to give them? It also depends on what you want to know through these annotations. If you have local people doing the annotations and you want to know their personal preference, you give them as little information as, you, as possible. Typically, however, you will give them a fixed set of rules. If you want a sample um, guideline, you can search Google for the Google search annotator guidelines. There should be a PDF online, like three to four pages, which explains which kinds of um, information Google annotators get in order to annotate web pages. Because so in this room, everyone typically knows what a search engine spam page looks like what all the um, links on it looks like, what a link form looks like. Your typical mechanical Turk person probably doesn't have that knowledge, so you need to tell them what you expect. Right. Uh, so the quality of the result to begin with depends on some specific knowledge, for example, this is a site arm, some technical knowledge or something like that. So the only people who can tell you if something's good without other people who know the topic. Yeah. Uh, what steps do I have to work with the users before I have to get this, or, or, or do I have to just go in and back? So the question was, if your site is very specific, say very technical site, how do I get that information into the people? Um, ideally, you will get annotators who have some background. So when I think back about the mapping use case that we had at Nokia, we always tried to find people from different geographies at least, so that they understand at least the language that's being spoken. Because evaluating a Russian restaurant, if you don't even know how to read Kyrillic, is kind of hard. It works with Google Translate, so it can be done, and developers have done it, but it's extremely hard. Now, it also depends on how much noise you can deal with. If you can deal with noisy annotations and you, however you cannot afford the domain experts in order to do the annotations, it's probably better to get anything annotated back than to have nothing. But usually you are trying to find um, domain experts. <laughs> Oops, <laughs> sorry. You got it? Good. <laughs> One more? <laughs> no more questions? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So the question was if you have multiple, 
if you have lots and lots of products and you have hundreds of signals that you have on your mind in order to ranking, what would be your st uh, standard approach? Um, first of all, I would go with whatever is your search engine comes with and try that, like with the default configuration and see how that works and go from there. Also, probably, I would try to not use too many signals to begin with. Like in text search, people usually start with tweaking which ranking functions they use. If they have standard text search, what I tell them is just do with, do what, 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 do whatever is shipped with Lucene by default, which is TF-IDF. And that's something that typically works extremely well. And with product search, I would probably start the same way. Just either start with an equal ranking or start whatever your gut feeling is. Because if you have no data, there's little you can do. Yeah? Depends. I mean, like sometimes you're, you're controlled not only by your content and, and what you see and what you search for, but sometimes, uh, or maybe maybe a key code for this is uh, like if you're controlled by your marketing, uh, yeah. they have a new advertisement uh, yeah. uh, uh, ongoing and they say, okay, uh, we want people to search for product X and Z at least, then uh, we want to bring the user to a new uh, uh, advertisement landing page or something like that. So, so that, maybe, yeah. maybe that's sometimes a start because this usually means they have a budget and you can start your work because uh, they pay you. And after that, going further into details, because uh, after a while, I'm pretty sure you will get uh, here some mails from customers who are saying, okay, everything I search, I, I land on this page, and very nice product, but I want to search for the rest. Uh, so usually, it's a, first of all, um, what I was talking about here was natural search. So there's a whole different topic about search placement, paid search placement. So there's a whole different topic about deciding which advertisement to show, which depends on the budget, which depends on how much a customer is paying in order to land up on, on the top, and which also depends on the relevancy. And in, apart from that, you shouldn't be waiting for your users to send you an email. Yeah, you should, yeah, you should see it at, really. you should see it much, much earlier, and you typically see it in your log files if you look close enough. And typically, you shouldn't do this looking just on request. Like when your manager is standing behind you, like what is what are users doing? Is it all okay? But you should have some kind of dashboard which shows you, which shows you the typical um, um, values that you should be looking at. Okay. Further questions? Yeah. Um, in an ideal case, you should be able to trust whichever uh, preferred user language the browser of your user sent you and targets the search for that. Typically, you can't do that. So typically, you might even do something like, okay, in which location is the user plus which is the preferred language plus some other par parameters that you use. When you do the sampling, it again depends on um, where do I want to improve search. Do I want to improve search for German users? So now I may look for queries coming out of Germany. That's not only German users, but it's probably the majority. I know the problem that you cannot trust the um, language that's sent with the browser, but again, Maybe your application has a means of finding out what the preferred user language is. Maybe it's a combination of you. Maybe you can guess the user language from the queries that these people sent. Ah, okay. So in in your case, you have like a button. Yeah. Okay. Okay. 
Yeah. So it's not as easy as I mean, it looks like an ideal case, but uh, in the, in that case, yeah, yeah, yeah in that case. Yeah. So in in that case, I would always default to the translated content if that is available in the user's language. And otherwise, try to find what is the best guess for what people speaking this primary language typically have as, as a second language. So you can't do any better. I can't think of a better way to do that. Because it always ends up being like guessing. Oops. <laughs> Here you are. End of end of third languages and fourth. <laughs> okay. I'm being told that I'm out of time. So if you have any further questions, come to our booth and get the remaining elks. <laughs>